So I'm Brian Buma. I'm an assistant professor in integrative biology at the uh, University of Colorado in Denver. So I originally started out in biology as pre-med, but then I got this experience of living and working in Eastern Oregon, the high deserts of Eastern Oregon, uh, studying vegetation and studying lizard distribution, basically studying the ecology of the high desert. And I had such a wonderful time learning about the ecology and the ecosystem and living and working in the wild that I couldn't let it go. So I decided uh, that's what I wanted to pursue. So my interests are really in disturbance ecology. So I'm interested in how catastrophic, catastrophic events like wildfires or windstorms or climate change in general is impacting species distributions, um, recovery, resilience, and adaptation to climate change. So most of my time is spent actually in Alaska or southern Chile working on things like boreal forest fires, uh, landslides, and uh, species distributions as a result. Uh, there's a lot to choose from. It's an it's absolutely wonderful career to be in. Uh, one of the most exciting recent ones was actually in Cape Horn in southern Chile. I was down there with National Geographic. We were trying to or, or have been working on global southern tree line. We're trying to find the southernmost tree in the world. And um, to do that for a couple reasons. One is to understand how global tree line is changing, how the southern hemisphere trees are changing. Are they moving south? Are they moving up? Are they getting bigger? As part of a big sort of global ecology question, but also to communicate science and to, to communicate the adventure and the excitement of ecology. So I'd say standing on that cliff where hardly anyone, if anyone, has ever really stood before and, and looking at trees that no one's ever really looked at before was, was an amazing experience. We're lucky uh, today to have Brian Bua here from uh, CU Denver. He is in their integrative biology program. Um, I met Brian at a workshop we were at on operationalizing resilience for fire and then saw him at IUFRO in Germany presenting on uh, some of his work on how disturbances compound and the ecological effects. And it was really fascinating, so I'm excited to have him here. They know many of you are. Um, so Brian works on disturbance ecology, did his PhD at CU Boulder, um, and then went to the University of Alaska Southeast, and uh, lucky enough last year came to back to Colorado. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's uh, great to be back, great to drive up. It's uh, until for the last five, six years I was up in Alaska um, and still pretty much all my work is up in Alaska, so I love to talk about Alaska. Uh, so I was at the University of Alaska Southeast, which is in Southeast Alaska, uh, the Panhandle. If you think about Alaska, people up there do it like the, the finger. There's the Aleutian Islands, that's Southeast. So it's down there. Uh, I'm still working up there. I'm still an affiliate professor in the Fairbanks, um, uh, Fairbanks campus and do a lot of work on fires up there. And I know everybody here loves fires. Uh, but today I want to talk about something that isn't fire. So just for variety's sake, um, I am a disturbance ecologist and I'm interested in all disturbances. I'm interested sort of in disturbances as a force as opposed to any particular event. So I have field work that studies um, fires, a lot of fires, but also windstorms, um, landslides, uh, insects to some degree, although not, not that much. Uh, and then one that's happening up here that most people have never really heard of. Uh, and so that's what I'll get into today. So, uh, but something that may be more important here in the future. I think this is just a leading indicator. So we're going to go to the remote north, uh, remote north Pacific coast. So I grew up in Bellingham, Washington, which is like right here. And Vancouver is right, Vancouver, BC is right there. And then everything north of that, there's like nobody. I mean, it, like hardly anybody lives there. Basically, from here to here, there's maybe 60,000 people total spread across 10 degrees of latitude. Like, there is, it's just remote. Uh, and it's, it's beautiful. It's justifiably famous for being wild, remote, intact, relatively speaking. Um, there was a lot of logging in the past, but um, you, still find, uh, you still find gigantic brown bears. Gigantic is not an understatement. You still see wolves. Um, I've seen a lot of wolves up there. For whatever reason, they're almost always black. I don't really know why that is. But this is a place where wolves actually fish. You can see wolves fishing for salmon. It's really neat. Um, and then Devil's Club, which is like the greatest plant ever. Uh, it's covered in spines, and the spines fester. It's a, it's a wonderful place to work. Um, 
beyond sort of the appeal of just the wildness, it's also the densest forest carbon biome on the planet. It's a temperate rainforest. So in terms of biomass carbon, temperate rainforests hold more carbon than any other forested biome on the planet. This isn't counting soil. Obviously the boreal forest has a lot in the soil. But in terms of just the amount of stuff you have to wade through, temperate rainforests win. Um, the current record holder is in Australia, temperate rainforests in Australia, but the study was done by Australians, so <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty dense though, um, and it just gets denser. It kind of peaks in its density down to near the Olympic Peninsula. We'll be talking about this whole range though, because I heard the theme was crossing borders, and this, this work has required coordinating across a whole bunch of different borders. So, so anyway, it's the largest U.S. carbon reserve, it's the largest U.S. national forest, uh, understudied and remote, uh, and it's also changing um, really fast. Um, temperature change, as you know, as you probably know, higher latitudes are changing faster, um, faster than lower latitudes, and so this is a place that's been warming up um, really rapidly. Don't switch then, see if I care. There we go. Um, so it's a great study system, the North Pacific Coast, because it's so high latitude that it changes really fast, but it's also fairly temperate because it's so maritime. So it's like a nice analogy for the temperate rainforest, most, or te excuse me, temperate latitudes most people live in, but one that's changing quicker or changing earlier. Um, and so we're in that, in that white circle, or we'll be talking about that white circle. Um, this place has been warming actually for a long time. It's been warming um, not just from anthropogenic climate change, but a lot of the effects you'll see today, see videos and stuff, actually aren't even our fault. <laughs> They're due to warming, but it's warming that's been happening since the Little Ice Age. So warming has really been going on since probably the 1500s or so, 1600s or so. So this is the Little Ice Age. This is a tree ring reconstruction from Glacier Bay, um, where I do a, a lot of work as well. And obviously it's, it's picking up. Um, but this trend has been around, uh, around for quite some time. Uh, so it's a useful place because you can see sort of long-term effects. You don't have to like project climate change or make judgments based on a few decades. Like you're kind of in the middle of it uh, up there, which is kind of nice. I mean, as far as those things go. It's also got a really long instrumental record. So it isn't just reconstructions. This is, this is just a random factoid. But it, it actually has a temperature law, temperature, instrumental temperature record going back to 1828, which is pretty impressive when you think it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, Sitka, Alaska used to be the capital of basically Russian Alaska before it was actually sold. And they um, sold to the United States. And they had a weather station in Sitka way back then. It was called New Archangel, or Arch, Archangel. Um, back then. Um, so they were recording temperatures in the 1800s and then there's this period where the U.S. took over and didn't do anything and then they started recording again. So we have instrumental records too. So to talk about these, uh, first to sort of set the stage um, so it's not just Alaska. Basically we're Kind of, we, I went into this, or you might go into this, many people go into thinking about how, what climate change will do to high latitude forests and think, well, in general, they might be more productive. Uh, you know, because cause these are often temperature limited systems, right? It's cold, uh, it's cold large parts of the year, the growing season is fairly short, and so anything which extends that growing season uh, will increase productivity in high latitude systems. That's a common, common guess. Um, is that the boreal forest will green up or any, any sort of high latitude forest will green up. And productivity maybe, uh, it kind of depends where you are. So we have a, b a bunch of modeling studies have come to sort of different conclusions. Um, sure, if in temperature limited system, if it gets warmer, it'll become, it'll probably grow faster, right? But then water limitation may be an issue. Uh, as well. So this is a, a, well it's a few years old now, but projections for forest growth uh, under climate change showing that it really depends on where you are. It's a water story as much as a temperature story. So there's still that question, like this place has been warming for a hundred years, is it really getting more productive? Because we would assume it would, but is it? So biomass uh, and energy limited systems, you know, we'd expect them to go up with increasing temperature and down with decreasing temperature. And this is a really 
big deal. Like th these sorts of, um, this sort of question, this just like which direction will go, is really important to forecasting sort of the state of the world's carbon. You know, if you think about high latitude forests, is a really important piece of the climate puzzle. This is a, this is a big, a big deal, and, and a lot of people are working on this. But one thing that a lot of people don't think about quite as much is the loss of snow in and of itself. Like the loss of snow, and that's what I'll get into first, and that's what some of you read a paper on, um, is, is a factor. And so um, places like this, we're going to lose snow. Like you're, you're going to lose snow. We're already losing snow, but we're going to lose snow more. It's going to start disappearing from the shoulder seasons. And in various temperate latitudes, they're seeing less and less of it at all you know, in the winter. And this is another case where this particular forest is a useful sort of leading indicator of what happens to forests. Because this part of the world, the North Pacific Coast, is losing snow faster than anywhere else in the world. So it's not just warming, it's also losing snow. And the, the reason for that is it's, it's, even historically, the winter temperatures are right about freezing. So it didn't take much warming to switch from snow-dominated winters to rain-dominated winters. We're not losing any moisture, we're not losing any precipitation, it's just changing phase, right? So it's just a physical change, it's like a one degree warming, but it has a pretty dramatic effect. So people are constantly joking down here, well, at least you've moved to Colorado and warmed up. It's like, no, <laughs> it's warmer up there. This is what January looks like in Colorado, now, or in Alaska now, in Southeast Alaska. That's a ski area and it sucked. Uh, we never got to ski. So that ski area didn't open that year, 2015. It didn't open in 2016. I mean, it sort of opened, but you were skiing on that. Uh, same thing happened this year. They didn't open until February. So there's just not snow anymore. And so that in and of itself is a potential problem. Like beyond just warming or changing precipitation, that's a potential uh, thing. Because we know, we know that snow is important to ecosystem functioning and, and the, the process, the, 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 um, the function of snow or one of the functions of snow is to insulate the soil. So if you have snow on the ground, the soil will stay relatively warm and by that I mean like zero degrees or zero or one degrees. So you can go into the middle of Alaska and a really cold spot, put a temperature logger under the snow and it'll actually be fairly warm. Like you guys probably know this, lots of animals live under the snow all winter and it's fine. Um, well, the problem is when you don't have that snow, cold snaps freeze the soil and cause all sorts of problems. Um, they cause, pro they kill, um, kill roots, they kill um, uh, meristematic tissue, that would be above the snow already, but um, they mobilize uh, mercury, there's been um, uh, mercury mobilization from sort of lysis of cells. There's just all sorts of issues that result from soil freezing. Uh, this was uh, this species, a birch species in the eastern U.S. There was a warm snap early in the spring in 2004, followed by a freeze, and there was this widespread tree mortality as a result. All well, this birch died. Um, same thing happened um, here. This was in the eastern U.S. They didn't all die in this case, but there was a massive productivity decline as a result of a warming spring and then a sudden cold snap. So all that together, we have a place that's warming, we have a place that's losing snow sort of systematically, so we're not talking about like cold snaps sort of every once in a while, we're talking about like a functional directional change. So the question is, what does that mean for coastal forests? So I want to show you a video of what those forests now look like. There's no sound. Um, so this is a lovely place where I do a bunch of my work. It's called Poison Cove which is on Dead Man's Reach, um, which is on the, bi this, the big body of water is Peril Strait. So it's a lovely place. Um, the bears, literally, they do have those dinner plate size footprints. They're absolutely gigantic. Uh, it's, it's just north of Sitka on Chichigaf Island. It's so named because red tide is a big problem up here. And in the 1800s, the Russians kidnapped a bunch of Aleuts from the Aleutians brought them there basically as slaves. They ate a bunch of shellfish, walked down the beach, and about three, depending on the story, 70 to 300 died. Uh, people died. So that's the, that's the story here. Um, but what you can see is a lot of dead trees. Uh, kind of all, 
all over the place. And I don't know if you can see it, but they're in the background too. Basically, there's what, what basically looks like a bathtub ring of dead trees uh, in this area. Um, all those trees are cedar, they're yellow cedar. Um, there's a lot of live trees too, but those are other species. Those are spruce, um, it's mainly Sitka spruce, and a little bit of west, western hemlock, uh, and the occasional lodgepole pine or shore pine. Um, but I don't know, you can see it back there too, uh, up there. And so there's been this mass mortality there, about 90% of the basal area is dead. Um, there's very little to no regeneration whatsoever. And it really seems like we have, in essence, a range contraction, a, a species shift. I'll show you data later that's, I mean, that, that component of the ecosystem is gone, uh, essentially. Okay. It is a nice place, though. You have to fly in on a float plane, which is great until the float plane gets stuck because of weather. Then you have to stay there <laughs> for a while. Okay. All right. And, and whole islands have died. So um, this mortality was probably in the 1970s. They stand for a long time. Um, this was probably in the 80s. This is near Glacier Bay. Um, again, these are spruce trees. All the dead ones are cedar. Um, this is near um, this place called Cake, Alaska, where we're doing some um, species manipulation experiments. We're basically trying to swap in other species, sort of an assisted migration sort of thing. Um, and, and this is just sort of your standard fisheye lens of an intact forest and a dead forest. So the, the, it, it's really hard to tell how a tree died or why a tree actually dies. And so the, um, there's a couple guys, um, but most importantly, Paul Hennon, who did such amazing work. He worked for the Forest Service, and he worked probably 20 years trying to figure out what was killing these things. And if you're a grad student, it's a great, anybody really, it's, a, it's a, just a great career trajectory to watch because it's like, if you go back at his papers, it's like, is it this? No. Is it this? No. Is it this? No. Like at first they thought, oh, it was some sort of pathogen, and then they thought it was some sort of, you know, some sort of pest, and then it was some sort of something else, and eventually they got to this point where, well, look it, it's all this low elevation stuff. Um, it seems to be areas uh, where snow is gone, where there used to be snow, and at the time that didn't really seem like a mechanism to kill a tree. But through, um, once I got thinking about it, like, it's not just where the snow's gone, it's where they're f shallowly rooted. And so I mentioned that snow insulates the soil. Here's, the, here's some data to that point. Uh, this green, that's temperature on the y-axis, and this is just time of year on the x-axis. The green line is under snow. It's a little higher elevation. The same place that video is from is just up the hill where there's healthy cedar. And the red line is from the areas you saw with, with all the dead trees. And there's no snow there. And so the snow, uh, the no snow is the red line, and it just bounces around more or less with the atmospheric temperature, which is in the black dots. And so this, this is what killed those trees. It was like a two, three day event, but that's why all those trees are dead. It was a fairly simple thing. Uh, you know, no one would really think anything of it. If you were there, it'd just be a cold day. It doesn't have to be that cold. It's like negative five degrees C. Like, I mean, it's colder than that. It's colder than that this morning here, probably. Uh, it's not really that big of a deal, you'd think, but for species not used to it, or species who count on a snowpack, um, it's a problem. And it's an interesting feedback, too, because what happens is the mortality, uh, let's go down here, let's work backwards, the mortality tends to open up the canopy, which leads to more rapid snow melt, or more potentially rapid snow melt for the snow that does fall, which then leads to more mortality, which then leads to more death. And so you end up with those sort of circles, uh, circles of death, which are slowly expanding uh, away. Now, what time is it? Um, the reason, this is kind of an interesting physiological question if you're interested in these sorts of questions, like why is this tree so predisposed to die? <laughs> like, why is it so crappily adapted to the lack of snow? And it's because it's got this really cool, um, well, it's just this interesting way of living. Uh, yellow cedar has evolved basically to exploit nitrate as its main nitrogen source. And that nitrate is most available uh, early in the spring. 
So uh, after the lysis of, of, of bacterial cells, and there's sort of a spring flush of nitrogen. So it wakes up early. It basically decold hardens earlier than most species. So it sort of set itself up to be pho uh, phenologically vulnerable, if you will. So it's a precocious species in the spring. It wakes up early. And there's lots of species that do that. And it's fine if it's under snow. But if it's not, it's sort of exposed. The other is the shallow rooting problem. Uh, and it, it roots quite shallow. Uh, one, because it tends to live in boggy areas. It's more competitive in sort of wetter, wetter areas. Uh, and um, two, again, to sort of take, take advantage of that sort of upper, upper microbial area, uh, uh, part, of the, part of the soil profile, where there's a bit more nitrate available. Um, yeah, I'll go a little more. Um, it's it, furthermore, it's, it's especially interesting if you're interested in biogeochemistry because it concentrates calcium in the soil. So uh, these soils are really acidic, which slows down nitrification, basically slows down the end cycle, which could be a problem. So this species actually concentrates a lot of calcium in its foliage, which then falls to the ground, of course, uh, over the years. And you end up with basically cedar living on this like pocket of high calcium soils, which raises the pH a little bit speeds up the nitrogen cycle a little bit. And so there's this nice little feedback of, we're going we're gonna to increase ca calcium in the surficial soils, increase the nitrogen cycle, and we're going to exploit it all at the same time. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You can walk into these forests and sample the soil, and the calcium goes way up as soon as you cross the boundary, and the pH goes way up as well. Not way up, but a, f a few points. You know, it goes from four to five. So it's this really unique thing. And to lose it is important for the ecosystem because it's like it's providing these little sort of little habitat islands that are different from everywhere else. It's, it's sort of like an ecosystem engineer in a way. It's also, um, so it's, it's sort of a keystone bi biogeochemical species, if you will. It's also really important economically and culturally, and so I never want to like not mention that. Um, so yellow cedar is, is one of the more valuable trees. Um, it's also been culturally important for 10,000 years. Uh, carving is a big deal on the Pacific Northwest Coast. This is the best wood to carve um, by anyone's um, estimation. Apparently when carving these really fine fine um, pieces of wood, um, or, or fine, excuse me, fine artistic creations basically, the difference between early wood and late wood is a problem for carvers. Yellow cedar has very little difference in terms of your, in terms of carvability. And so there's, there's not a lot of difference there. So there allows them to make extremely smooth grained stuff. The bark is used in weaving. On the last slide, I've got a chill cat blanket. And it's with these beautiful blankets, which are built from, from bark. Uh, it's useful in bent wood boxes. So the native people used to make, oh, they still do. They're just horrifically expensive. Um, they'd make boxes. But instead of like cutting pieces and gluing them together, they take one plank and fold them you know, steam them and fold them. So there's only one seam on a bentwood box uh, on one side. It's pretty neat. All right, so when I got there, and this is uh, about six years ago now, um, people had just sort of just identified what was causing it. Like 2012, they're like, oh, it's the lack of snow. Or they'd really put a nail in that, I guess. Um, we still had no idea how bad it was. Like no one had no idea, we just didn't know, they just knew it was happening, but all those studies were just from that Poison Cove area, basically. And so we didn't know how big, it, how big this issue was. We knew cedar went from Alaska down into, say, the Pacific Northwest, like Washington, Oregon, but we didn't even know where the species lived. Like we didn't know where it was. So this is a transboundary question, so to the theme, you know, crossing borders. We wanted to... Um, what we needed to get a handle on how bad this was, if it was going to go extinct, you know, all those sorts of questions. We really need to know where it was. Um, just to note, these are, the, these are the tribes of the sort of north coast. This one here is actually how it got its species name. Its species name is Nootka tensis, and one of the ways you end up pronouncing this tribe is Nootka, um, in short. So, all right. So we had observations that it was potentially dying. This is Alaska. So an island that's dead. Um, but then because the Alaskan and the BC foresters talk a lot, uh, you know, there's, there's some, a little bit, there's some collaboration there. Like, you know, your trees may be dying too. 
Uh, and so they went out and start, didn't really even start looking for it until 2005. And lo and behold, they started finding dead trees kind of all over the place. Um, this is from uh, Crow Lagoon, which is sort of near Prince Rupert, which is sort of as high as you can get in BC and still be on the coast. Um, similar area, um, fairly close to there as well. Again, a bunch of dead trees. So we knew we needed to sort of figure out or get a handle on the problem, you know, get a handle on this climate change thing. Like, what, what is lack of snow doing to this forest? Was it doing it to other species? What, you know, is it just cedar? Where is the cedar, et cetera? So that was a task that took several years, was just figuring out two really seemingly obvious questions, but when you're in the middle of nowhere, they're not so easy, which is just where is this tree and how much is dying? Uh, the problem was it spanned several borders. Um, so we had a really kind of hard time doing that. Um, we had to figure out how to mix Alaskan mapping uh, and modeling with BC modeling, with Washington modeling, with Oregon modeling, and even with California modeling. And it was kind of a, it was a pain in the butt. In Alaska, we had presence and absence data for where the cedar was and where it wasn't. In Canada, we only had presence data. And in Washington, Oregon, and California, we didn't even have that. We just had a model of suitability, like where it should be. And so basically what we ended up doing was kind of degrading everything till it matched the best accuracy we could do. <laughs> so we could map where cedar was with about 77% accuracy to 80% accuracy in Alaska. And so we ended up basically cutting down the other, uh, sort of like trimming the other ones until we matched that accuracy. Because if you went down here, the whole state was covered with like 1% likelihood, um, which is pretty cool, uh, but it worked. And then for the, um, for the decline map, we, um, we had like presence or absence of decline, like dead or live yellow cedar up here. Here we had dead, live, or a trace of dead, which we didn't even know what that meant. Um, so to be conservative, we ended up dropping that. And then in Washington, Oregon, and California, there was no mapped decline, but they had also never really heard of it because there wasn't a lot of communication between Alaska and the Northwest, or not as much as you'd expect. So we're not clear how much they actually looked for it. Um, the cedar down there is so sparse and far between um, that it's not even sure you'd catch it if they were dying anyway. So that's still actually a research need to be identified. Um, but just to show you what we found or what we ended up coming up with was cedar that has a really extensive range, like 20 degrees of latitude. So this is a really well distributed species in this forest. It dominates the forest in some places. It actually runs from northern California all the way to south central Alaska, pretty close to Anchorage. Um, but it basically follows the permanent winter snow line. So if you have uh, permanent's the wrong choice, but uh, you know it, persistent winter snow line, that'd be a better word. Um, if, you can, if you know where the snow line is, it, where it's reliable in winter, that's where you find cedar. So um, I would find yellow cedar when I was a kid if I just went up in the mountains a little bit. And I could guarantee I'd find cedar right where I found snow I could snowboard on all winter long. <laughs> um, uh, up in, uh, and so it kind of follow, it basically goes down, it doesn't get to low sea level until about here. Whereas in California, you can actually find it in the Klamath in Northern California, but you find it very basically on the tops of mountains on north facing slopes. Very rare, but it's there. Um, it's, it's been called an arboreal erratic, which is kind of a really cool evocative term, I think, uh, because there's also populations in Eastern Oregon in the desert uh, on springs. There's a population near Burns, Oregon, which is, um, it, it looks like this. Like it's, it, it sort of looks like Colorado. Uh, and there's this like water loving temperate rainforest species that's like sitting on a spring. No way it could have got there. Uh, or, you know, basically what we think has happened is it's just persisted since the last ice age in that one spot. Um, uh, same with central Alaska, that we don't know why it's there, but it's probably survived the last ice age in some sort of glacial refugia way up there. Um, there's one in eastern BC as well, similar sort of thing, kind of off by itself. So it's got this really strange sort of distribution that suggests it's really good at persisting, but not really good at spreading. So as far as decline goes, 
Um, the mortality is generally 70% of the basal area or more, so it's pretty extensive. And about two-thirds of it's actually in British Columbia, where they didn't even think to look until 2005, because no one thought the loss of snow was that big of a deal, uh, other than the ski industry. Um, and nobody lives there anyway. Um, so it's, it's about 5 to 8% of the range, um, and it's, it's, it's pretty solid. Um, but this exercise is really fun and really interesting because, again, people in BC weren't really thinking about it. And what we started to notice was, well, there's live cedar in really weird places. There's live cedar in places where it's really warm, which was an odd thing. Like, okay, our whole hypothesis when we started this was that wherever snow goes away, it's, it's, you know, it's going to die. And so, like I said, it followed that winter snow line, or that's what we all thought. And then when we did this exercise of like working with the Canadian government and working with our models and actually predicting where it was, we're like, lo and behold, there's yellow cedar on the outer coast of Vancouver Islands. The low elevation's here. There's actually one population which you can't see on the map, but it's right on the coast in Washington. Like, why, why are they there? Which was strange. Why is it in the Alvord where it's low precipitation? Uh, just an odd, odd thing. And so the paper I sent out was sort of a, a first exploration of that. Um, what, what I did was I took weather station data from these climatic areas where there's cedar, but there's no snow, just to see, like, maybe, wh like, wh they don't need the snow? And it turns out that in areas where, um, where they're persisting without snow, it never actually gets cold. So these are the weather station, this is the weather station data from 1960 to 2010. Uh, mean temperature the coldest months is just a proxy for how cold it gets. Um, this is that sort of below here trees die, below negative five trees die. This black area, black lines are from areas where there's still plenty of snow. The red areas are from places where uh, they've died in the past, like 60s to 80s, and the green areas where they seem to be doing just fine. And lo and behold, they can be warm. They just can't ha again. They just can't handle that freezing. Um, which is kind of a weird, which, which leads to a really weird conclusion. So to step back, this work was done as part of an endangered species review, which is still ongoing. Um, they wanted to know where things were dying and how climate change was going to affect the species. And so you start doing this model and you find, you find out this sort of thing, like, well, they don't die when it's really warm as long as there's no cold snaps. Uh, but they do die in this sort of middle zone. And you start projecting it to the future, and you end up with this weird hypothesis that they don't just die at a certain climatic threshold. They die at like a transition zone, but not on either place on the other side. So that paper I sent out was this like transitional mortality hypothesis, if you will. Um, I mainly put it out there because I wanted people to think about it, because I've never heard of it before, really, or not a lot. Because it leads to an inevitable conclusion, which is really weird, that the faster the warming, the better for the species. Like, sort of a rip the band-aid off approach, right? Like, because if you, if you project out the fastest climatic change, they cross this threshold faster, and they don't end up, they lose their snow, but they also lose the cold snaps, and they actually do better, because it's not like every year has a cold snap. So if you can cross that danger zone fairly quickly, you're better off than if you spend a lot of time hanging out in this sort of exposure area. Um, so this is still very much a hypothesis, but it sure seems to be supported by the distributional data in this species, that if you can get past this, this sort of snow loss zone, maybe you're all right. I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive, and it was really jarring to read it in the Endangered Species Review, where they're like, well, faster warming is less of a threat to this species than slower warming. But it might not be that far off. We don't, even if you look to areas that have died 100 years ago, we don't see a lot of continued dying because those places don't get that cold anymore. They just don't have those cold snaps. And so it's an odd, odd thing. Um, but it seems to be supported by the data here, at least. Um, so, so this is what it looks like. Um, actually, I'll go back. So. Basically, what we came down to as far as this particular tree goes is the heart of the range is really in trouble. The area where the majority of the species live is really in trouble. Um, 
this, it's a complicated figure. This is uh, latitude going from California to central Alaska. Uh, and this is just an average where if you're at the bottom, you're likely to die, and at the top, you're pretty healthy. Um, this is uh, mainly just look at this side. This is sort of your average score over the next 50 years, and this is sort of the worst case scenario, so they're pretty similar. Uh, this black line is the proportion of the species in the range. So this is, the, this is basically the Canada and Alaska part. That's the California part. So I said there wasn't a lot in California, and it's true. There's hardly any. Um, most of the species in the future uh, are going, uh, most of the range is going to be exposed to mortality. So this is an important conclusion. This, basically, where the species dominates, it's likely to mostly disappear. But lots of places are projected to be pretty healthy in the future as well. But counterintuitively, it's the southern half that's probably going to do better than the northern half, because the northern half is warming faster. And it's crossing that, it's moving into that transitional zone, where the southern half is either past it already, or so high up, it's, it's, it's cool. All right, so our conclusion for this particular tree, and this is the Canadian conclusion as well, the conclusion with the Canadians uh, and the Washington folk, is about 60 to 60 on the low end, that's the conservative number, um, will be exposed in the next decades. So we'll probably lose 60, maybe more, of this range. Um, but a lot of the areas have already been exposed, and so, um, there's places in the range where it's not dominant or anything. It's a fairly small component, and it's not a big part of the range. But they're probably safe. So that leads to this, so just as an aside, because there's a lot of policy folks here too, that's an interesting conservation question, right? Like, you're, you're killing the vast majority of this species, but it'll probably be okay in small parts. What do you do? Like, where, where do you allocate your resources? And that's what they're still sort of struggling with. Like, we're gonna lose, this, this forest is gonna lose a large component of itself due to snow, snow loss. But that species will probably, you know, hang on elsewhere. Okay, so now back to the first question, which was, so the first part of that was just snow. What happens when snow goes away? Well, it certainly kills individual parts of the ecosystem. But what about the forest um, as, as a whole? Um, so let's talk about the ecosystem level stuff. Um, first of all, what's there? Um, this ecosystem stores about uh, 4.5 petagrams of carbon from the Alaska and the California part alone, which is quite a bit. That's just a one meter depth. So this was a study led by a postdoc of mine who, again, working across the borders, integrated um, soil data and then used um, some machine learning modeling uh, techniques to basically predict how much carbon is on the landscape in the soil. And so most of the carbon is in the soil, and it's correlated with higher moisture areas. And rain's supposed to go up in this part of the world, so we're not expecting to lose a lot of soil carbon. Um, ecosystem level, uh, or excuse me, the forest is really dense. so. This, is, this just came out a few weeks ago. We modeled carbon in the forest too. Um, this is just Southeast Alaska. We haven't got to BC yet because they don't have quite the same data um, the US has. Like we have FIA. They don't really have an equivalent program with, they do, but they don't have it at the same sort of spatial resolution we need. Um, we're looking at about 1400 megagrams per hectare in some places. For a total ecosystem carbon right now at about 3.3 in Alaska alone, so about seven petagrams total in this area. And so what's it doing? Well, we're killing a lot of those trees. You saw how many trees were dead in that video from the loss of snow. Well, if you look at the ecosystem as a whole, it's growing. This forest is actually gaining carbon, and it's gaining carbon really fast. Uh, it's gaining about a teragram a year in Alaska alone, so again, double that, maybe a little more if you include BC. Um, so the forest is getting denser in forest measurement plots. It's also expanding. Um, this was a study I did with the Forest Service. Uh, we looked at basically every, the distribution of forest mortality events and the for distribution of forest uh, recovery or growback events basically uh, via remote sensing. 
And um, then we looked at FIA plots and whether they were getting bigger or smaller, you know, gaining biomass or not. So from the FIA plots, we know that the forest itself is getting denser at about a rate of that. We also know it's expanding. So this is the number of disturbance or, or gain patches by latitude. Lower latitudes, it's pretty balanced, but at high latitudes, the forests are expanding also. So, um, and I should say, this remeasurement period corresponded with a warm phase of the PDO, so it's probably a good representation of what it'll look like on average in the next coming, um, coming decades. So, like, how do you, you know, reconcile the two? And what you come up with is one species is dying, but others are picking up the slack. Uh, and the survivors are picking up the slack. And because there's no water limitation, climate change is increasing growth. And this has led to some interesting arguments. If uh, I'm sure you don't follow the yellow cedar literature, <laughs> but uh, we published uh, these papers saying, look it, it's dying everywhere. And there was a sort of a counter paper from the Forest Service which said, no, it's, it's actually biomass is increasing in yellow cedar. Uh, in, in parts of southeast Alaska. And so the question was, why is that the case? And it's because if you look in the right spots, most of the yellow cedar's dead, but if you ignore that, the survivors are growing faster. Similar with everything else. So it's actually gaining, bi like I said, it's gaining biomass. You're like simplifying the forest, but you're gaining stuff overall. So from a carbon perspective, this thing is doing great. From a species diversity perspective, it's doing fairly poorly. Um, if you want to think of yellow and yellow cedar in the yellow here, it dies, but the forest recovers just fine uh, and actually puts on, puts on more, which is a surprise, um, but uh, a, a welcome one. So kind of the, the take home, um, two take homes. Um, one, I think yellow cedar has is, is been called the canary in the, in the woods, canary in the coal mine sort of idea. Um, this is a species which is sensitive to snow, but we have signs that other species are too. So that birch tree, I showed that graph at the beginning, as far as I know, that's the only real study on that mortality event. Um, but it's another species where snow disappeared abnormally for one year and a whole bunch of mortality resulted from a cold snap. Now these things won't happen every year because you don't get a cold snap every year, but um, so any place where you have reliable winter snow and it starts to disappear, this is something we're interested in. Uh, and it's starting to be picked up around the world. Um, I'm running a symposium this summer at, at this conference and I sent out a call like, who's seeing snow loss result in mortality? And lo and behold, people started raising their hands all over the world. Like places where snow is disappearing because it's getting warmer are finding these sorts of large scale outbreaks of sudden dead trees, um, which is kind of interesting. So unexpected vulnerabilities. This, this was like a one degree of warming and all of a sudden uh, a, pot, a whole species is threatened. Uh, that's an unexpected vulnerability, but there's also unexpected, you know, resilience, which is kind of which is kind of cool too. Like the ecosystem could absorb it in this latitude. Uh, you know, the 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 uh, you lost a species, you lost a certain type of habitat, sure, uh, but it's not like everything fell apart. And so the cultures are adapting. This is a chillcat blanket made with um, cedar bark. But in places where the cedar have died or never were, they make it with spruce roots. Like they, they've adapted culturally to this, sort, to this sort of presence or absence of a given species. Um, bears will actually eat yellow cedar, but if that goes away, they find other sources of food. Um, they just nibble on the phloem in the spring. Uh, so so it's, an, it's a story sort of of change that was kicked off by natural forces, but accelerated by us. But I don't like ending things on sort of a downer. So, so there's some positives here too. Um, and in the last few minutes, um, sort of to, to give that to you in a different mode of thinking, and I hope the sound works. Um, the forest is not dying entirely. Um, and like I said, cedar will survive in some areas and other areas species will take over. Um, Western red cedar, which if you have a shingles on your roof or decking is probably made out of western red cedar, is actually expanding in this area. It's migrating north, and it seems to be migrating north with the dead yellow. They occupy the same habitat, and whenever, it, but its range ends kind of right about, well, I actually know where the northernmost red cedar is. It's right there. Um, it ends right there. 
And so if you go into these areas, or upper elevation these areas, you find red cedar moving into wherever these yellow have died. So you kind of, it's this sort of dance of species, which is really neat to see. But you can hear it too. So I was, I'm going to play a little music, and again, hopefully you can hear it, of um, actual data. And what it is, it's data from a, a, a transect, which runs from north, this is Glacier Bay, if you've ever been to Nas the National Park, uh, outer coast, um, where the cedar are healthy, through areas where they're all dead, to areas where they've been dead for a long time, and so the forest is recovered. Um, let me... There's 48 plots. Each plot is a measure of the music. And this, the, again, the, the, the music will move north to south. So, so with that, um, I'm out of time. Um, uh, but hopefully it ended on a, a somewhat of a nicer note of, um, yeah, well, balanced note. Anyway, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> So a billion people have worked on this, obviously, um, over the course of the, of, of the last many years um, to really nail down what caused it, um, the ranges, and then also the ecosystem level stuff, the carbon stuff. I can talk about any in, in exhaustive detail and a billion other studies from that area too, um, but I like the story. Um, funding from a variety of places, uh, and that's about it. minutes for questions. Does anyone have any? Yeah. So Brian, I was wondering, uh, did the mortality influence mature, mature trees is the same way as it did uh, seedlings? Yeah, it's such a it's such a great question, and we really that's another that's a question we don't have a good answer to. Um, so, yeah, mature trees usually died faster than the seedlings. Um, but we don't really know why. So the reason this happens is the fine roots die. So the hypothesis is they're more dependent on their fine roots, basically. And, and they basically dry, die of thirst. Like, it's a, it's a, it's, they're unable to transpire, and even though it's raining all the time. Um, but we really need to know, like, when seedlings are vulnerable or not to understand the conservation strategy. And that's not something we really know all that well, because these things can reproduce vegetatively. And so you get into, like, a musk egg which is a sphagnum bog, it's called musk eggs up there. Um, there'll be like thickets of cedar that are all like this tall that are doing just fine, probably reproducing vegetatively. And that should be a place they would especially die because they have very shallow roots and it's very exposed to the atmosphere. The so snow melts really early. But oftentimes they're not. And so if anything, it seems like these clumps of seedlings do better than the big ones. And we, re we really don't know why yet. And so. Um, we're actually trying to look into that right now, but sort of the leading hypothesis is maybe these trees, because they grow so thick, these seedlings grow so thick where they do grow, are sort of functioning as their own snowpack, like insulating the soil themselves just by see it being so dense. So that's, that's one idea. The, the only other real hypothesis we have is maybe they have random dry spots where they can root deeper, but that's not very satisfying. Um, so it seems like the dominant ones die much faster than the smaller ones, yeah. The, um, uh, the places they die the fastest tend to be on very productive, well-drained um, slopes because they're, they're sort of already pretty stressed through the competition with everything else. So mortality tends to be more complete in those areas. Mortality is higher in these muskeg bogs, but there's more of them. So the percentage uh, tends to go down a little bit, yeah. So good question, and I wish we had a better answer. Um, but it's something that Fish and Wildlife really wants to know for their Endangered Species Review. And if you could repeat the question whenever you Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. You, you know? Yeah. It, it, where, where you have these die-offs where, where they've occurred in the past, mm. it seems like they've always been able to recover the yellow cedar to some extent in almost every case. Is that right? It's not so much that they've recovered. Um, in fact, they haven't recovered. The mortality is often not 100%, right. so you'll still have one or two that are hanging on. Okay. Uh, we don't see any place where they've died off and actually come back to dominance. Yeah, we, don't, we haven't seen any of that. So by the time you've gotten through this transitional mortality phase or whatever, yeah. a lot of the... 
we don't expect them. Which has been taken up by other tree species. Exactly, exactly. So we, we would never expect them to be, where am I going here, um, dominant in the same way they are in southeast Alaska, but they're still alive. And so from a conservation point of view, that's a, that's a plus. <laughs> uh, they've definitely lost their edge, yeah. So these places, it's, it's up north, you're a long ways north, um, but stuff grows like crazy. I mean, this western hemlock grows like a weed, it'll grow fast. Uh, and so it just shrubs up and then takes over and they've, they've lost their edge, yeah. So their long-term prospects, it's hard to say. I mean, these, we, we've cored them that have been uh, 1,500 years old. So they're long-lived species. So you also hate to make big or it's, it, you hesitate to make big pronouncements over 40 years of monitoring for a species that'll live to be 1,500 years. But, but yeah, they've lost their edge. <laughs> about, um, I'd seen that you were going to do some research in southern Chile, like the Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, kind of in the context of this and like forest regimes, is that pretty related to the research here or is it kind of a different? Well, kind of. So the question was about the work in Cape Horn. Um, yeah, so I, I also, um, I just got back from, from um, Cape, from Cape Horn, uh, where I was doing a project with National Geographic. So I'm a Nat Geo explorer and had this big thing, um, to go down and find the world's southernmost trees, southernmost forests, uh, and document that, basically. So uh, it, was quite the, it was quite the adventure. Uh, it's a nasty place. Uh, it's windy all the time. Um, the boat rides are gnarly. Uh, a lot of people were sick for a long period of time. Um, big waves, uh, big winds. We were camping in Hurricane Four. It was brutal. Um, but that was one of the questions. Right? was like, so how are they changing as this sort of thing goes? Um, snow loss in southern Chile is also a concern. Uh, they don't have snow as low down as we do in Alaska or southeast Alaska. It's much more maritime down there. By the time you get to the latitude of Cape Horn, the globe is 98% water like if you go all the way around in a circle. Um, so it's much more maritime. So at sea level, they actually have less snow than comparable latitudes up north. So Cape Horn's 55 degrees um, south. Um, but up a little bit, they do have snow. And so the Cordilleras down there, the Darwin Cordillera is the southernmost ice cap outside of Antarctica and the sub-Antarctic islands, retreating very, very quickly. Similar with the permanent snowpack up there, retreating very, very quickly. Um, there, uh, we don't see much mortality yet down there because it's really just it hasn't been going on as long as up there um, but there are some some curious patterns that I don't have a good answer for yet so the southernmost forests in the world seem to be growing faster where they're still alive but the edges are dying I don't know why <laughs> uh, so you have these small patches of forest which grow in protected areas in southern Chile because it's so windy it's windy all the time um, they're limited to these, these, these basically pro, um, protected drainages, so east-facing drainages and north-facing drainages, so equatorward and, and east. Um, the edges have been dying back, and they appear to have been dying back for some time. So if you move a little away from the patch of trees, there'll be really old dead trees, and then right next to it are a bunch of recently dead trees. But as soon as you get into the patch, they're growing really, really quickly from the cores. So it could be something similar to this. It's probably not snow, because th this is fairly low elevation stuff. But something where like the climate is getting more favorable, but it's also getting more harsh in a way like like some sort of punctuated event maybe is killing these things even as the climate gets more conducive to their growth which is similar to yellow cedar it loves a warm i mean warmer environment for cedar it'll grow faster too the problem is the cold snaps down there we think the problem is probably the wind and it's just uh wind storms are increasing the average wind speed is increasing um, around Cape Horn with um, climate change, or that's the models anyway. Basically, as it warms up further north, it sort of constricts the westerlies more in the summer, which increase their speed. Uh, and so we're getting more wind, we, we think, this is the working hypothesis, getting more wind mortality events, even as the trees grow faster. So again, similar story, kind of a, a, a race. Now, granted, all of that was essentially speculation because no one's ever looked at these forests before until about three weeks ago, ever. No one's ever cored a tree, no one's ever done anything. So, big grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just
just wondering, are there any like obvious differences between these remnant populations that are in these warmer places? Like, does anyone look Another great question. No. <laughs> Like yeah, so the question was, is there any obvious difference between the species, the individuals here, which seem to be doing fine with the warmer climate, and here, which are kicking the bucket at, alarming, at an alarming pace? Don't know. <laughs> we honestly don't. Um, like I said, we've really just tracked down the cause for this, and then the last couple of years, we've tracked down the extent of this. Now, yeah, now it's, that's the next question. So I'm actually submitting a proposal this week um, to examine, um, to do some reciprocal transplants between the geographic north and south, but also the climatic warmest and coldest um, stands, because we just don't know. There's been... Um, uh, one, two genetic studies, which have kind of done the spatial distribution and looked at spatial structure. One of them found a solid spatial structure between Alaska and Washington. They kind of skipped BC. The other one didn't find anything. So there's like disagreements amongst the geneticists. Basically one says the other didn't do a good job and vice versa. Um, so that's not much help. Um, they seem similar. <laughs> You know, they have similar environments and same habitats, but we really don't know. So this is very much an open, that's an open question, uh, long story Trade short. Plasticity could have something to do with those seedlings? I, it might. Um, it might, oh, you mean the ones like in the decline areas? Like in those bogs where there's just like a dense mat of them. Yeah. It, seem to be more hardy. Yeah, it, that, that, is a, that is a good question. Maybe they've sort of grown up in sort of this no snow environment and so they're a bit more adapted than the old ones which established yeah, 300 years ago. Something that has such a long lifespan. Exactly. A lot of this decline area probably happened during the from trees that expanded during the little ice age sort of got too big for their britches and now they're just sort of getting cut back um, as it's warmed back up. So that's a great question and we could do that. I had a master's student document the northernmost here, you go to the northernmost edge and it's like little patches of trees. Um, like literally there's one where it's just a single tree and there's no other yellow cedar for kilometers. One where there's 10 trees. Well, you have to hike and it's just sort of like a little treasure hunt. It's really kind of fun. Um, but you could certainly go there and investigate the rooting habits of, of the seedlings growing in those areas and compare it to areas, because that place is still cold enough. Compare it, not, not for much longer, but cold enough for now. Uh, compare it to areas. I, I, I don't know what you'd find. It's a great question. Um, I'm recruiting students. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll ask Hannah to say thank you. Thanks.